So I'm Olga Petrova, and I'm a machine learning engineer um, here in Paris. I'm working at Scaleway, which is uh, the cloud provider division of the Iliad Group. And today I'm going to talk about harnessing the power of generative adversarial networks for supervised learning. Or to put it more simply, I will um, talk about how to generate content using a particular type of an artificial neural network. Uh, but before we dive in, I'll just go over the plan for my talk. Um, so we'll start with some general introduction about what it means to generate content using AI, or deep learning in particular. Um, so afterwards, we'll discuss some of the differences between supervised and unsupervised learning. And actually, during my talk, you will see that I cover some of the basics, um, because the audience is kind of mixed. Um, so for that, I apologize to those who are already well-versed in the subject. Uh, the second part, the deep learning pipeline, here we'll discuss some of the building blocks of a typical deep learning project um, and how we can use the modern uh, hardware accelerators to our advantage. And finally, the um, technical meat part of my talk is the face frontalization GAN. Um, so there I'll present the model that I developed for Scaleway. So generating content with AI. Um, if you follow the AI news, um, you have probably seen this website in the recent months. It's called thispersondoesntexist.com. Um, so what happens when you go to the website is that every time you hit refresh, you get a new person, uh, a new picture of a person's face. So these are some of the ones I got. Um, something that's kind of both fun and creepy is that um, none of these people actually exist. They all come from the imagination of an artificial neural network that's called StyleGAN that was developed by NVIDIA. Um, so actually, the fact that it was developed by NVIDIA is no coincidence, because NVIDIA, of course, is the manufacturer of graphics processing units, known as GPUs. Um, and training this sort of networks is very computational intensive. So we really have to use GPUs over CPUs for that. Um, now I can't help but mention that we actually do have a GPU offer at Scaleway. It comes with a nice NVIDIA Tesla P100 GPU, which is what I use to do the training for my project. Um, now back to machine learning, um, supervised versus unsupervised learning. So the example that I just mentioned, this person doesn't exist, Gan, um, this is actually an example of the so-called unsupervised learning, because the way that it works is there's a model, and you just show the model a bunch of pictures of people. Um, so in this case, this was um, 70,000 images that NVIDIA took from Flickr. Um, and the model, in the process, it learns how to generate new pictures of people. So the reason why this is an example of unsupervised learning is that the training data is not categorized in any way. Um, there are no corresponding outputs to the inputs. The inputs are just all put together. Um, and this was actually the original use of GANs. Um, they were supposed to be used for unsupervised learning. Now, in supervised learning, you have labeled data, and um, one of the very kind of simple textbooks example of this would be um, the dog versus cat classifier. So say you have a bunch of images of dogs and um, images of cats, and you want the network to learn how to distinguish between the two. So then your training set looks like pictures of dogs and cats that are labeled, say, one for dog, zero for cat, or the other way around if you're a cat person. Um, so here the outputs are the class labels. But actually, the outputs don't have to be labels, even though the term label data kind of suggests it. The outputs could be anything. They could be text, or they could be images as well. Uh, so for an example of both inputs and outputs being images, we can turn to super resolution. Um, this figure actually comes from a paper from a couple of years ago um, out of uh, the team in Twitter, uh, where the, um, they take the low resolution images and they um, super resolve them. They turn them into high resolution images. Um, so the result is already kind of rather impressive on this image here. Um, and we will see how to make it even better. So before we do that, I will just mention that typically GANs were not used for these sort of supervised learning tasks. Um, however, 
Um, we can look at the super resolution model developed still by Twitter and compare the result with GAN on the right to the result without GAN on the left. Um, and hopefully you can see from a distance that the one on the right actually looks um, quite a bit better. It has better visual quality. Um, this is by far not the only example of using GANs for supervised learning. So let's look at some others. Um, here's another one. This task is called face frontalization. Um, this image comes from a paper also from 2017 from an academic group in China. Here the inputs are um, profile images taken at an arbitrary angle, just like the ones in the upper row. And the output that you want to get are images of faces of the same people, but taken at a full frontal view. So that's why the task is called face frontalization. Um, and the figure comes from their paper. So their generated output, the output that was generated by their model is the middle row. And if you compare it to the ground truth, the correct outputs um, in the bottom, you see that the agreement is actually uh, almost scary. It's really, really good. Um, their model is quite complicated. It's rather specific to the face frontalization task. But one of the things that they use is a GAN architecture as well. Um, there's another example of using GANs for supervised learning that you may have seen because it was making rounds on Facebook some time ago. Um, this task is called image colorization. Um, this is when you take, uh, for instance, old black and white images or even videos and you turn them into modern looking full color ones. Um, so this is an example that comes from a project called Deoldify. So there's an iconic picture from the era of the Great Depression in the US that was turned from black and white into full color. Um, in their model, they use something that's called no GAN. And I find the name rather misleading because it doesn't mean that they're not using a GAN. It's just a particular type of GAN training that is involved. <clears throat> So we have seen some examples of GANs being used for supervised learning, but the question is, why would you want to do that when originally they were meant for unsupervised learning? And once I discuss the structure of a GAN, we will see for why that is. Um, so this question that I wrote here, it can be broken down further into three parts. Um, so why is it that uh, some supervised learning tasks benefit from GANs? what types of task, um, tasks can benefit, and also how should it be done from the technical standpoint. Uh, to answer the first one, I'm going to develop a model, um, actually two versions uh, of a model that, is very sim that are very similar to each other, except that one has a GAN architecture and the other one doesn't. So we'll compare the results of the two and discuss why one does better than the other. Um, so for this, I had to pick an example. Um, I tried to pick something that could be easily generalized to other tasks. Um, in the end, I went with face frontalization because the architecture of the model is actually rather general. Um, so here, my goal wasn't to recreate the work that was done two years ago uh, by the Chinese group. It was rather to develop a general kind of architecture that could perform reasonably well for this task as an example. Um, the code that I developed is um, all posted on Skillways GitHub under the frontalization uh, project. And um, today we'll also discuss some of the interesting technical um, and also kind of intuitive insights that I learned in the process. Um, and finally, you can also just take the code that's posted there and just use it with your own training set. And if you do that, please do let me know what happens. OK, so the deep learning pipeline. Um, I will talk about face frontalization, the face frontalization GAN that I built later. But for now, I'll just use, an, use it as an example in this part. Um, so basically, in this deep learning model, we have inputs. We have the model. And when we input the inputs into the model, we get outputs. That's fairly straightforward. Um, so in this case, our inputs are profile images of people taken at an arbitrary angle, and the output are going to be frontalized images of the same people. Um, so the actual product that I, as a machine learning engineer, uh, have to build is the model 
And there are multiple aspects to the model. The model has a certain type of architecture and hyperparameters, and these are things that are set by the machine learning engineer. But an equally important part of what constitutes a model are, of course, the trainable parameters. These are the numerical values that are learned in the process of training. Um, so speaking of which, um, there are two regimes um, involved in machine learning. There's training when you are learning the right parameters of the model. And then there's inference or predicting or using the model that you have already trained for inputs that the model has not seen during training. So here I will mostly focus on the training um, in this talk. Um, so how do we train the model? As I said, this is supervised learning. So we have inputs and outputs. We feed inputs into the model. We produce some generated outputs. Then we compare the generated output to ground truth, so the actual photographs of people taken at full frontal view. And then we adjust the trainable parameters to get the generated images closer to the ground truth. So that's, um, that's all there is to it. Um, this process is typically done in mini batches. Um, so for this model, um, I found that it's best to use smaller mini batches. I use the size of 30. Um, and then one pass for the entire training set um, is called one training epoch. And the reason why I mention it is that it's a common unit of measurement um, in uh, machine learning that I will use later on. Um, so now I'd like to mention some of the frameworks that I used. Um, the code is uh, naturally written in Python. Um, and something that surprised me is that uh, today I was in this room the entire day, and I heard uh, TensorFlow almost in every uh, deep learning talk. But I haven't heard anyone mention PyTorch. Um, I don't know if it was mentioned upstairs, but PyTorch is my personal favorite uh, deep learning framework. I do recommend it for those who haven't tried it. Um, in addition to PyTorch, I also used a different framework called DALI. Um, this one is um, more recent, so I um, decided to spread the word. DALI stands for uh, Data Loading Library, and it comes out of NVIDIA. Um, so the purpose that DALI is said to achieve is to uh, remove or at least decrease the CPU to GPU bottleneck, because at least when you're doing computer vision, typically you are inputting images and then you're doing some pre-processing. Um, this could be all sorts of transformations. It could be crops, resizing, um, normalization, etc. cetera. Um, so normally you do these on the CPU, then you transfer the images to the GPU, and that's when you do your um, actual training part. Um, but because pre-processing is down the CPU, you run into this bottleneck problem. So the solution that DALI provides is that the pre-processing steps are done on the GPU already, then it keeps your images there, feeds them straight into the network, and then it proceeds as before. Um, DALI is already available for common deploying frameworks, such as TensorFlow, which seems to be popular here, um, and PyTorch, which I really like, um, and also a few others. It is a young project, so um, there are quite a few use cases that have not been developed yet. Um, but it, it is open source, so you can feel free to extend it. I actually had to do it for my project, and the code for that is also on the GitHub. Um, now, I mentioned GPUs already, um, so now I will just explain exactly why they're better than CPUs for deep learning. Um, so first of all, when designing the model, um, as we know from the previous talk, where it was explained very nicely. Uh, we have to test multiple architectures and um, sets of hyperparameters, just try to see which one is better. Um, now, each time we do it, training deployment models is very computationally intensive, um, because there are so many trainable parameters. And also, deep learning typically needs a lot of training data for the same reason, that there are so many trainable parameters. Um, so we'll look at these two um, challenges separately, uh, starting with the computation one. Um, the computations are indeed quite heavy. So for my face rentalization model, I have close to 8 million trainable parameters in total. Um, so it makes sense that we want to parallelize the computations as much as we can. Um, 
CPUs are not very well suited for this, whereas GPUs are optimized for these sorts of calculations. And the Tesla P100 GPU that I mentioned earlier, it actually has 3,584 cores, um, and we'll see just how much faster uh, the training goes on this GPU versus the CPUs. So here I picked um, some instances that we offer at Scaleway because, well, I worked there, so it was easy to do the training on our own instances. Um, so I've been distributing the training among four CPUs versus doing, them on, doing it on a single GPU. And for the phase rentalization GAN, um, the training time per one epoch takes eight and a half hours distributed among four CPUs versus only 18 minutes on the GPU. So 18 minutes are easy to picture. It's um, less than half of the duration of my talk. Um, the eight and a half hours are a bit harder to visualize, so I decided to help you with that. Eight and a half hours are enough time to watch the entire last season of Game of Thrones. Not that any of us would want to do that again. Um, <laughs> but uh, you also get over an hour left over after that for food and bathroom breaks. So we can compare that with the 18 minutes. Um, but in addition, um, we all probably know that GPUs tend to be much more ex expensive than the CPUs. However, once you factor in the difference in time that it takes to train the model, uh, not only is, in this case, the GPU over 28 times faster than the CPUs, um, it also ends up tra being uh, training the model for less than half the price. Um, and another um, challenge that I wanted to mention was the fact that we're using so much training data. Um, so you know, for those who do really the big, big, big data, this might not be much, but it's something to be taken into account. We keep on feeding in batches of images over and over again. Uh, my, the size of my training uh, set was um, 700,000 image pairs, which takes over 13 gigabytes on disk. Um, so ideally, you want to store them locally rather than do this over the network. Um, and finally, the technical part. Um, so first, I will talk about generative adversarial networks, um, this very exciting uh, invention by Ian Goodfellow in general. Um, so they were um, invented, uh, as Hamza mentioned, in 2014. And there was uh, some cool story behind it involving beer and the bar, and I don't know what happened afterwards. Um, but since then, they have become very famous in the community. Uh, in fact, Jan Le Kuhn, uh, the director of Facebook AI, he has referred to them as the most interesting idea in the last 10 years of machine learning. Um, since then, he has actually upgraded them to the coolest idea in the last 20 years of machine learning. Um, so the takeaway is that he mentioned them multiple times, and they're only getting cooler in his opinion. Uh, so what's so nice about them? Um, here's an image that I actually took from that website there. Um, but there are two networks at play here. There is something that's called the generator, which actually generates um, the images. I will talk about generating images, but in principle, you could use them for generating other content as well. Um, and then there's the second network that's called the discriminator. And what happens is that you train the two against each other. So precisely what that means is the following. Um, here we'll use the MNIST example, just because the image that they found had um, these images of handwritten digits on it. Um, so let's say what you're trying to do is generate uh, synthetic images of handwritten digits. So the way you would go about it is um, you would have a training set with handwritten digits, just your MNIST set. Um, normally, when you're doing digit classification, you actually have them labeled as zeros, ones, twos, threes, etc. In this case, you don't want to do that. Just you don't care about the labels. Just put them all together into the set because this is unsupervised learning now. Um, so you have that training set. And you also have a generator. The generator is going to get uh, some, some amount of random noise as input. From that input, it is going to generate images. Of course, at first, the images will look like noise themselves. Um, and what happens afterwards is that the discriminator is going to get two types of inputs. The discriminator is going to get fed a batch of 
real handwritten digit images coming from your training set. Um, but it will also get a batch of the fake images that have been generated by your generator network. Um, the discriminator is nothing but a binary classifier that is supposed to distinguish between what is real and what is fake. Um, so for those who do binary classification, the loss function is just binary cross entropy. Um, so discriminator is going to be trained with that objective in mind. And um, the loss is defined for the discriminator, but actually, if you remind yourself that um, part of the inputs that get fed into the discriminator have been generated by the generator, you see how we can also train the generator in the process. Um, so the objective for the generator is different. The generator has to get good enough um, so that it can fool the discriminator. In other words, it needs to get good enough that the images that have been generated by it get accepted as real rather than fake. And um, the basic idea is that by the time that it happens, uh, you are starting to generate images that uh, look as good as the real ones. OK, so um, this was the GAN architecture. And um, now we'll talk about um, the architecture of the generator for my face frontalization GAN, because um, what we just discussed was um, um, GAN for an unsupervised learning problem. My problem is. Uh, for supervised learning, so the generator is actually going to have inputs that are not noise, that are real images. Um, and the architecture that it has is a very um, generic one, it's the encoder and the decoder combined. Okay, so the generator. Um, the point of the generator is to take those input images um, taken at arbitrary angles, so 19, almost 90 degrees in this case, um, and the output is supposed to be a person's face at zero degrees, the full frontal view. So the size of the input, um, the images that I take in my network um, as input, they're 128 by 128 pixels, and they're full color, so we have to multiply that by the three channels. So in the end, the size of the input, the dimensionality, is three times 128 times 128, so that's close to 50,000. Um, now, if you think about you know, the faces of people that you know, you um, can also think about, do you really need 50,000 worth of numbers to distinguish between those faces? Um, so maybe the answer is no. Uh, it turns out that for the network, the answer is indeed no. So we can analyze the face. Um, by analyze it, I mean take these 50,000 numbers, put them through a deep convolutional network. And at the end, we arrive at um, a few numbers. So in my case, this is 512 numbers. This is not some kind of magic number, however. This is just um, the low dimensionality that worked for my network and for my training set. So for you, it might be different. Um, so we analyze the face. We come up with 512 numbers. And this is the part that's called the encoder. Now we have a second part that's called the decoder that is going to take the 512 numbers and use them to reconstruct the face, but at a different angle. So that's the output that it produces. And together, the encoder and the decoder make up the generator. So this is a rather um, general kind of architecture that works for a wide range of um, computer vision problems. Um, now, what is the advantage of having this low dimensional bottleneck in the middle? So in the process of analyzing the face and then reconstructing it later, um, the network learns the important features of the face, uh, and it learns how to ignore all the noise that doesn't really matter for its purposes. Um, so I don't expect you to read the code, but um, this is just the, um, uh, the screenshot coming from my GitHub. Um, this is the generator network, so actually I Place it so that on the left, I have the encoder. On the right, I have the decoder. So on the left, I have six convolutional layers um, with some batch normalization layers and values in between. And in the decoder part, I have six deconvolutional layers. Um, deconvolutional is also known as uh, convolutional transposed. Um, so the way it works with convolutions is that they decrease the size of the grid at every step whereas convolutions transposed are going to increase the size of the grid. 
Um, so as you can see, the, um, the architecture of the encoder and the decoder, they're kind of symmetric to one another. Um, so that's the architecture. Now, how do we get an actual working model out of it? Well, this, of course, is done through training. Um, so that's the slide that I had earlier when I talked about training before. So we have the inputs, we have the corresponding outputs. Uh, we want to feed them into the model, compare the generated outputs to ground truth, and adjust the parameters. Now, how do we know how, which way should we adjust the parameters? Um, so there is a quantity that, um, that quantifies the difference between what has been generated and the ground truth. That's called the loss function. Uh, for, um, for these sorts of projects, we use something called the pixel-wise loss function, where we, take, uh, we literally take an image that has been produced, compare it to the ground truth, pixel by pixel. Look at the per pixel differences. And there are multiple ways of doing it. So I'll just mention two that are most common. Um, you can uh, look at the absolute values of the differences and just sum them up. Or you can um, take the differences and square them before you sum them up. So that's something called an L1 loss or L2 loss. And you see that L2 loss kind of looks like a mean square error. So it starts to look familiar. Um, for face mentalization, I found that it doesn't uh, matter too, ma too much which one of the two you use. But uh, in principle, you could keep both in your code and just uh, you know, turn the knob as to the relative importance of uh, which one you want to place on. Now, I mentioned ground truth multiple times. Um, so since there is ground truth, of course, this means that we have a supervised learning uh, problem. And uh, the training set, we have inputs with corresponding outputs. Um, so why do we even need a GAN for this? Because as I explained about GANs, typically they're used for unsupervised problems. Uh, to answer this question, we are going to first train um, just the generator uh, without touching the discriminator at all and see if we are happy with the results. So actually here I should mention that in this picture we have the inputs, the model, and the outputs. Regardless of whether we're using a GAN or not, um, the model that we want to produce in the end, this is just the generator. So if we are using the discriminator, it has been used during training, but we don't use it at all during inference time. OK, so um, to see the benefit of using GANs, we are going to first not use them. Um, so here are some faces that I generated using this um, architecture of the generator that I explained. Um, the loss function I'm using here is L1. So I didn't put the inputs here, but basically we're comparing the generated output to the ground truth. Um, these are the faces that are generated after a single training epoch, so after we have passed through our uh, 700,000 images once. Um, they definitely start to look like people early on. Um, they're quite blurry at this stage. Um, so let's see what happens after 10 epochs. They look better. 50 epochs, again, they look better. I do have a plot of the loss function at the end. I just didn't put it here. Um, 400 epochs, actually at this point it's hard to tell the difference between what has been generated and the ground truth outputs. Now, how can this work given that we are only using 512 numbers to represent every face? So how is it that we can reconstruct such a wide variety of faces using only that little information? Um, here I just want to stress um, the distinction between the um, low dimensionality in the bottleneck, um, what I'm using to reconstruct the face, with the number of trainable parameters. Because the number of trainable parameters is actually uh, close to 5 million, just for the generator alone. Um, so yes, we have 512 numbers in the middle, but we actually are using 5 million parameters in order to analyze the face down to that number and then to reconstruct it later. Um, so this number of trainable parameters is what allows us to, um, to reconstruct um, pretty much any phase using the input, at least for the training set. Now, we know that the generator can fit the training data, as I said, um, but the goal is not to fit the training data. The goal, of course, is to have a model that is going to take an inputs that the model hasn't seen during training and uh, produce the correct outputs. 
So it also has to generalize beyond the training set. Um, this brings us to inference, and uh, let's see how well we do on inference. Um, so not so well, actually, but right. Um, coming back to Game of Thrones before things got bad. Um, the top row are the inputs. The middle row here um, are the outputs that have been generated by a model that has only been trained by uh, for a single training epoch. So as you see, they're kind of blurry and fairly noisy, just not that good. Um, after 50 training epochs, they get better. 400 training epochs, they actually start to get worse again, and it's all down from there. Um, if you're doing machine learning, then this is a very obvious thing that is happening. Um, training the model for too long leads to overfitting to the training set, uh, which means that the model doesn't generalize well beyond the training set. So ideally, we want to be able to generate um, good results for the training set early on, um, and then just take that model and use it for inference. Um, now, this is uh, when the GAN comes back into the picture. So now, rather than training the generator, we're going to train the generator and the discriminator. Uh, we're using the very same generator as before, um, but now there are two objectives for it. So the first objective is, just as before, to minimize the pixel-wise loss. However, it also has a second objective now. Now we want to fool the discriminator into believing that the images that we generated um, are real. So alongside the generator, we are now training the discriminator between, uh, to distinguish between images that have been generated by the network and uh, frontal face images that are there in the training set. Um, so here the image that I have is um, the results from the old model, only the generator that has been trained for a single epoch. These are results from the new model where we trained the generator and the discriminator. It's pretty hard to see the difference when I show them like that, so let's zoom in on some faces. <coughs> so here on the left, I have images coming from just the generator. On the right, we have images coming from the generator and the discriminator. And if you look at the fine details, because otherwise they look pretty similar, but if you look at the fine details, you see that um, the, pic the people on the left don't have uh, don't have eyelids uh, or eyelashes or all those good things, whereas people on the right do. So it is precisely in the fine details um, that the GAN performs better at. Um, so at first, this seemed like a sort of surprising random result, but actually, if you think about it, it makes sense. <clears throat> And uh, of course, the reason why this is a good thing is that uh, once we get uh, better visual quality for the training set, we can stop training, and um, the final model is going to generalize better. Um, so the question, um, that was the first out of the three-part question that I asked. Uh, why is the visual quality of the, the output better with GANs? <coughs> So now, instead of just using the pixel-wise loss function, we use a combined loss function that has the pixel-wise component for the generator and also the binary cross-entropy for the discriminator. So the pixel-wise loss is going, to <coughs> uh, is going to focus on how close is the generated output to the ground truth, whereas the other one focuses on are the images real or fake? How close are the images that we generate to the real photographs? If you think about those fine features that I mentioned, like the, the eyelids, the, uh, the eyebrows, the corners of the nose, all those sorts of features, they actually make a rather small contribution to the pixel-wise loss. Um, so they don't become sharper until much later in the training. <coughs> uh, however, conveniently for us, it turns out that the discriminator seems to use precisely these fine features to distinguish between what is real and what is fake. So the generator learns that, and it starts to produce faces that look more realistic in order to fool the discriminator. Um, so here's uh, well, a better example of what happens when you have GANs. Um, so the images on the left, um, they come from the test set. They weren't seen by the model during training, but they were taken in the same kind of uh, lighting conditions as the training set. So that's why the model performs better on them. So the upper row is the input. Uh, the middle is the generated output. 
Then we have the ground truth. And um, even if we take our Game of Thrones characters, it also does quite a bit better than just the, uh, just the generator. Um, so this was a model that was only trained for 18 epochs. Um, I did use a bit of a strange training regime where I trained, it, trained the GAN for one epoch, just the generator for one epoch, again the GAN for one epoch, just the gen generator for one epoch. So that's how I got those results. Um, and of course, at inference time, we only need the generator, as I mentioned. We don't need the discriminator at that time. Um, so in, if you think about super resolution, another, um, another example of using GANs for supervised learning uh, problem that I mentioned before, <coughs> here the visual quality also has to do with fine details. Um, so you can apply the same sort of intuitive reasoning for why using a GAN helps in this case. Um, as I mentioned, the code uh, for this model is um, all available on this um, GitHub repo. Um, so the architecture of the model, there's nothing there that's specific to faces, um, which is why it could have uh, performed better on them. But it is very general, so you can readily use it for your own training set. Um, now, to hopefully help you with that, I will mention some of the interesting findings um, that I discovered in the process. Um, so first of all, of course, nobody uh, forces you to just train the GAN or just train the generator. As I mentioned, I got best results when I trained the GAN and the generator in an alternating manner with different epochs. Um, you could also first train the GAN, then add the discriminator or the, the other way around and see what happens. And in terms of hyperparameters, as I mentioned at some point, I found it best to use a small um, uh, batch size during training. So I used 30 for face rentalization. Um, something else that you want to pay attention to is that um, throughout most of your training, your pixel-wise loss and the binary cr cross entropy could be different by multiple orders of magnitude, so three orders of magnitude for my training set. And in terms of the network architecture, um, the first point I did mention, the um, inside the generator, my decoder is basically the inverse of my um, encoder. And uh, also, the architecture of the discriminator was rather similar to the architecture of the encoder. So that's something you can see from the, um, the code. Um, and um, this is it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.